Amen. First John chapter 3, verse 24. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he lives in us. He has given us of his spirit. I wanted to start right here this morning because John just comes right out and says it. That the evidence that reassures us that we are a Christian is that Jesus put his Holy Spirit in us. That when we believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us. Now, John didn't just get this idea in a dream. This idea was given to John by Jesus himself. In fact, this developed theology, this developed belief about the Holy Spirit started as John listened to Jesus. So listen to some of the things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Turn to John chapter 14. In fact, it's interesting if you read the Gospels, the Apostle John, the disciple John, has the most material in his Gospel about the Holy Spirit, and then he has a lot of material in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John about the Holy Spirit. But look at what Jesus said in two sections. We're going to look at John 14 and then jump over to Acts chapter 1. But look at what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And you'll notice in your Bible that the word Spirit is capitalized. That's a very, very important understanding as you're reading the Bible, because the word Spirit can mean different things. When it's capitalized, it means the Holy Spirit. When it's not capitalized, it can mean several things. It can mean your own spirit. It can mean the spirit of the world. It can mean an evil, demonic spirit. It could mean all kinds of things. And then you got to dig in to the context of the verses and do a little bit of extra study and dive into the scripture some. But in this case, the word spirit means the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus says is he is the spirit of truth. We'll get to that in a minute. The world cannot see him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. What a powerful thing that Jesus says. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will be with us and in us. So John began to formulate this understanding of the Holy Spirit from Jesus himself who said, hey, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he's going to be with you and he's going to be in you. And then after Jesus rose from the dead, he spoke to his disciples about the Holy Spirit. These are some of Jesus' last words. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is preparing the disciples some of his last words right before he went back to heaven. And here are some of Jesus' last words to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. He said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, notice what Jesus says. I think it's really important what Jesus is saying here. First of all, remember with me that the disciples who are listening to these words have been with Jesus for three years. Jesus called them into ministry. Jesus said to each of them individual, individually, follow me. And they left their home, their livelihood, everything. And they followed Jesus Christ. And every single day they lived with him. So every single day they saw Jesus. They talked to him. They felt him. They heard him. They witnessed his teaching. They witnessed his miracles. They, they saw him raise dead people and open blind eyes and cast out demons 
They watched him die on the cross. They, they witnessed him risen from the dead. You would think if there was anyone on the planet that was ready and prepared because they had spent so much time with Jesus that these guys would be ready to present the gospel to their generation. But Jesus says what? Wait, you're, you're not quite ready. There's one more thing you need. You need the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Now, if Jesus said the most important thing for these original disciples was having the Holy Spirit alive inside of them, then how much more important is it for you and I, who haven't been able to spend that physical time with Jesus, to have the Holy Spirit alive inside of us? It's just as important, if not more. Now, John wanted every single Christian to understand this powerful truth that we just unpacked in these four verses. John wanted you and I to understand that the Holy Spirit lives in you. This is a powerful way to live. When the Holy Spirit is allowed to live in you and walk with you, and you allow the Holy Spirit to help you live for Jesus, when you have a firm grasp on how the Holy Spirit works in your life, your life will never be the same. Your life will completely change because your life will not be about you. Your life will be about Jesus. Now, for us to have a firm grasp on how the Holy Spirit works in our life, I want to share a couple undeniable things about the Holy Spirit living in us that are important. The first one is this, that the Holy Spirit lives in us when we believe in Jesus Christ. When we make that first initial uh, decision to say yes to Jesus and make him our Savior and Lord, that's the moment that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. It was revealed to us in 1 John chapter 4 and in 1 John chapter 3, but I'd also like you to see it in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, there's a great verse about how this works in our life. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says this. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Wow, this verse unpacks it all, that you heard the message of truth. You heard the truth about Jesus Christ. You heard the gospel that could save you. And when you heard it, you believed. You changed your life and you believed in Jesus Christ. You believed in yourself and in the world and other things, but you heard about Jesus, you heard the truth of it, you heard the message of its salvation, and you made a decision to say yes to Jesus. This verse says, when you and I did that, when we believed, we were marked in Christ with a seal, and that seal is the Holy Spirit. Now, this is super important because a seal is... Maybe something that we're not really familiar with in our culture because we don't seal anything anymore in wax with our, with our family label. We e-sign everything now, right? Have you noticed that? You can buy a house today without even ever using a pen. You just e-sign everything on the internet. But that's not how things have always been done. In the first century, you sealed things. And I think we all understand that. You'd take some wax, you'd drop it on a piece of paper, and you would take your seal, which was normally a piece of metal with an emblem on it that uh, was a figurine or a symbol of your family or your authority in the community. And you would stamp it in that seal. And what it meant was that whatever is on this piece of paper is, is my word. I, I, I'm, it's the truth of what I'm saying. And so what this verse is saying is that when you and I said yes to Jesus Christ, Jesus sealed us in his blood. In his blood, with his blood, he sealed us. And the way that we know that the deal is done is that the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. We've been purchased by Christ and the seal is done and the Holy Spirit comes 
to live in us. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to know everything about the Holy Spirit and understand everything he wants to do in your life in that moment. But the rest of your life, as you let the Holy Spirit in, he will lead you and you'll become more like Christ every day. So the Holy Spirit helps us understand and comes into our life when we believe in Jesus. The next thing that the Holy Spirit does is help us obey God, not ourselves. Have you noticed how difficult it is to battle our own self and what God wants us to do throughout the day? Our own thinking, our own actions, our own words. It's difficult, isn't it? That's where the Holy Spirit living in us can help us. Because the Holy Spirit helps us obey God, not ourselves. It's a dangerous thing to obey our own selfishness. In James chapter 3, verse 16, James said, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. I don't want evil practice in my life, so that means I've got to rid myself of envy and selfish ambition, and the Holy Spirit helps me with that. I think it's apparent and very real that if everyone on our planet lived selfishly, that the planet would be a difficult place to live. Our problem is, it seems like we're heading that direction, doesn't it? That's not a good thing. So the Holy Spirit helps you and I live differently, live in a different way. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, if you were in Ephesians, you can just go over one page. In Galatians chapter 5, the Bible tells us what it's like, or it gives us a description of this challenge between our selfishness and the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit wants to help us with this. Look at what it says in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh is our own selfishness, our own sin nature. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen? Now, where God wants us to live is in the fruit of the Spirit. As the Holy Spirit is in our life, there becomes fruit out of our life. For instance, this morning, you showed self-control by showing up at church an hour later than you normally do. That was self-control. That was the Spirit working in you. Now, the Holy Spirit and our selfishness, did you notice what he said? They're in conflict with each other. Have you ever felt that throughout the day? This felt like this war's going on inside of you. There's a decision you have to make. And man, you're just fighting that decision. Should I do what the Lord wants me to do? Should I do what I want to do? That's conflict. That's the Holy Spirit trying to help you honor Jesus with your decisions. The goal of a Christian is to let the Holy Spirit guide our life so our lives tell the story of Jesus all throughout the day. This understanding that we also see in Scripture is a Holy Spirit-filled Christian is not a selfish person. In fact, the more we walk in the Spirit, the less we are selfish. Because selfishness is not a part of God or God's kingdom or who Jesus is. Because Jesus did the most unselfish thing. He put all of us first and himself last. That's what being a Christian is. It's walking away from that selfishness. The third thing we see that the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit gives us power to be a witness for Jesus. We saw this in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where it said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
all around us and all around the world, right now there are people that need Jesus as their Savior. There are friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, other people on the other side of the world that have never heard about Jesus. Everyone needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ. And do you know who the Holy Spirit uses to tell people about Jesus? You. You and me. That's our job. But the Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to do that. Have you ever woken up in the morning and said, Holy Spirit, would you help me be able to share you with somebody today? That's a, that's a good prayer. It's a great prayer, but I'll tell you right now, if you start to pray that way, the Holy Spirit will bring people into your life. Just like randomly, out of the blue, you'll like go to sit in the workroom and all of a sudden a coworker will come and sit down next to you and just say, hey, what's different about you? And you're like, oh, wow, today? We're going to talk about that today? Right here at work? Yep, we are. And you get to share Jesus with them. Your neighbor will just come over and ask you how life is going. And before one thing gets to another, all of a sudden you're talking about Jesus. And you're like, well, this just happened. How did this just happen? Well, it didn't just happen. You asked the Holy Spirit to do it and he did it. You said, Holy Spirit, can I share Jesus with somebody today? And he brought somebody into your life that you could share Jesus with. He will give you the power to do that because the Holy Spirit empowers those who believe in Jesus to tell the world about Jesus Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us when we believe in Jesus. The Holy, the Holy Spirit helps us understand how to live for Christ. And the Holy Spirit empowers us to share Jesus with others. The Holy Spirit is kind of, kind of like living on a farm. Follow me for a moment. Imagine you, you live on a 1,000 acre farm. And the farm represents your life. The farm provides you food. It, it, it's space for you to grow food for your family. You have animals on your farm. So you have bacon and steak. It's good. Ribs. You getting hungry? But the farm is work. In the spring, you go to your garage to get your farm tool. Now, your tools are essential for life on the farm because it'd be foolish to have a farm without tools. Everybody knows that. You got to have tools on your farm. And the tools are a figurative representation of the Holy Spirit in your life because the tools are what help you on your farm. They're what help you in your life. And the Holy Spirit is what helps you in your life. Now, many of us, we, we go to the garage and we grab a tool that would represent the Holy Spirit and how much of the Holy Spirit we use in our life. And so we grab a hand shovel and we start working. And we go out, 1,000 acres, by the way, is a lot of land. You know that, right? We take our hand shovel and we start digging rows. Pretty soon, what are you going to realize? This is hard. This is going to take a long, long time, and my family might starve to death. But that's what you've chosen. You've chosen a hand shovel. That's the extent of how much of the Holy Spirit you've led into your life, about the equivalent of a hand shovel. And so you realize one day, I, I really have got to let the Holy Spirit into my life more. I've got to let him into every area of my life, and I've got to let him take over. And so you begin to find that as you let the Holy Spirit in, that you have a bigger tool. You discover that you're now working with a team of horses and a plow. And man, when the horses get going, you can really move some dirt. So now you have these powerful horses, and they're working with you. You're allowing the Holy Spirit to help you in your life. And, and these horses can really dig more dirt, and they can really make life easier. But you're still not even close to who the Holy Spirit is. I mean, you haven't even understood yet fully how much power the Holy Spirit has in your life. See, the Holy Spirit is sitting in your garage still. 
because he's more like a John Deere power tech, 13.5 liter, 824 cubic inch, six cylinder, tier four, stage five compliant diesel engine with 640 horsepower. We're talking about a machine here. Look at that GD. That's what the Holy Spirit's like. Now you're moving. Now you're working with power. Now you can work your farm. Now you can get things done in your life. Amen? Now we're talking. That tractor's in your garage, folks. That tractor's in you. Why do we go for a hand shovel? The fourth thing is this. The Holy Spirit lives in you to enhance the intimacy that you have with God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now follow me. When Jesus died on the cross, it was the most miraculous thing ever. You remember that when God created this planet, he created the Garden of Eden. And he placed mankind in it. We were perfect at that point. And God said, I only have one rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we did. We sinned. We walked away from God and we said, I want to do stuff my way instead of God's way. And so ever since, all of us have been born with that sin nature. That, that understanding that I should do life my way instead of God's way. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, because Jesus died on the cross and rose again for you and me, when we believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes in, the Holy Spirit gets to come in because we're completely forgiven. We're set free. And what Jesus did was restore life for the believer back to what it was like in the garden. Because now, because the Holy Spirit is living in us, you and I get to walk with God, talk with God, listen to God. All of that has now been restored to us in its perfect state like it was in the garden. The challenge is, that's the way it is. The challenge is listening in the world in which we live, right? That's the challenge. But the John Deere's in the garage. It's there. All the power is available and ready and waiting. So the Holy Spirit lives in us. He does that to help us understand how much Jesus is a part of our life. He does that to help us obey God, to be a powerful witness, and to encourage and enhance our intimacy with God. Now, John's second declaration about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit helps us live in the truth. There's several verses that help us with this in 1 John. So go back to 1 John. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 5 to 8, John says this. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood Jesus Christ. Now, you'll remember that John is combating a, a thought process here that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh, that it was just some sort of mythological thing or, or, or overly spiritual thing, and that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. And what John is saying is, no, Jesus came by water, so physical birth out of a mom, and he came by blood, which meant he was real. He was a real, live human being. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because, and get this, the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. See, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in our life because he is in us is he helps us understand all truth. That means you and I can understand the truth of God's word. We can understand truth about our world we can understand truth about everything. And I don't know about you, but I think we live in a day and in an age and in a generation and at a time when you and I need to know the truth. 
Because as soon as we leave here and go out into the world, our world is full of lies. It's full of half-truths and lies and things that are kind of close to the truth, but not the whole truth. So sometimes it's complicated about how we should live. And so you and I need the Holy Spirit today so that as we walk through this complicated, challenging life and world that we're in, we know the truth. And we can live in it. And we can put the truth into practice. Now, there are lots of directions I could go with this. I could speak for, we could speak for hours and days about how much the Holy Spirit reveals to us. But I just want to talk about two things quickly that I think are relevant to us today. The first is this. The first truth that the Holy Spirit helps us with is the truth about Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is always pointing us back to Jesus. Always. And look at what John said in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. He said, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, here's a good illustration of what I was talking about earlier about the the use of the word spirit in scripture. You'll notice that it says this is how you can recognize the spirit of God and spirit here is capitalized talking about the Holy Spirit. And then the next half of the sentence says every spirit and you'll notice spirit is not capitalized meaning the human spirit, the demonic spirit, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, why did John say that? Because you'll remember, as we talked about last week, there was a group of people that had left the church and were saying that Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. They were saying that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, that it was just some sort of spiritual, mythological thing that happened. And what John is saying is, no, If you truly believe in Jesus Christ and have the Holy Spirit in you, then you understand that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was a real person who died on the cross and rose again for you and I. And he goes on, verse three, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ is not from God. See, the the Holy Spirit always points us back to Jesus This is why it's so important for you and I to be living in the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit in us, to understand the truth about the Holy Spirit because he's always pointing us back to Jesus Christ. The second one is one that I believe is also relevant for our lives today, and that's this, that the Holy Spirit tells us the truth about ourselves. The truth about yourself. And I think this is becoming more and more confusing every single day in our culture. We don't understand the truth about ourselves. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason is because we have two prevalent viewpoints of how you and I got on this planet. We have two viewpoints about humankind, about ourselves. The first is that you and I are the result of a biological organism evolving for millions of years. And as, as we believe that, there's no purpose. There's no value. There's no hope for who we are. But God comes along in the Bible and he says this. He says, you are amazing. I knew you before the creation of the world. Before I created earth that would have life on it, I created you. And I knew exactly when I wanted you to be born in the time frame that you would be born. And I knew right when I would put you on the planet. I knew you before the creation of the world. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Before your mom and dad thought about having you, I thought about having you because I knew you millenniums before that. God says, I created this planet for you. God says, you're a very special creation of God. In fact, when you were created, I broke the mold, not because I didn't want another one of you, but because you're so special. God said, you are created in my image. You're like me. You're not like an animal. You're like me. And I've placed my life in you. That's who you are. Now, let me ask you a question. Which option sounds like it will help people value the image they see in the mirror? 
Which will help you understand the truth about yourself? Which one is a lie and which one is the truth? Because that's happening in our culture, can you understand why we're so confused and living the way we are? It's because we don't even know about ourselves anymore. We don't even know what it means to be human, to have a heavenly father who created us and loves us and wants the best for us. And that's because we haven't invited Jesus in and the Holy Spirit in. But when they come in, when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and he helps us see and live the truth about ourselves every day of our life. Now, this isn't easy. It's challenging. It's hard. It's difficult. And it's hard because our life is full of rocks. Follow me. Let's go back to the farm for a minute. There's rocks in the field, aren't there? Those rocks are there. Some are small, some are medium, some are large, but some are huge. And these rocks, they represent our sin and our selfishness. And they're in our field. And when the rocks are in our field, life can't get in the field. Healthy things can't be in the field. What we need to sustain us spiritually and physically and our life in Christ, it it can't grow in the field because there's rocks there. And so the Holy Spirit comes along in his power and he says, I want to remove those rocks. Now, some of them you say, nah, I got it. And that's fine because some of the rocks can be removed by a hand shovel. But some of the rocks are large. They're huge. And you and I, We try to remove it with a hand shovel and it just doesn't work. We don't have the strength to fix it. We don't have the power. It doesn't even matter if we dig all the way under it. We can't lift it. We can't get it out of our field. We can't get it out of our life. Only the Holy Spirit can. So the Holy Spirit comes along and he has your pastor preach a message about your rock. He has you go to camp and the speaker talks about your rock. You go to a Christian counselor and the Christian counselor talks about your rock. But here's the problem. The world tells us just to paint that rock yellow and slap a smiley face on it. It's okay. Everybody has rocks. But then we discover we're we're just trying to live in this field with giant rocks all around. The tractor keeps running into them and we can't get them out and it's just making life difficult and year after year, we just keep running into the rock. That's because the Holy Spirit is trying to remove that from our life because the Holy Spirit's always telling us the truth and the Holy Spirit's saying, you gotta get that out of your field. You gotta get that out of your life because I wanna put healthy things in you. I wanna put things that are gonna grow and mature and be healthy for you in your field and in your life and that's in the way. So this morning, would would you hear the Holy Spirit say, let's get that rock out. Let's get that habit out. Let's get that sin pattern out. Because I desire for you to live like Jesus all the days of your life. And season after season, God will take rock after rock out. Thankfully, he doesn't take all of them out at once, amen? But but today, he wants to take one out, and next week, he'll take another one out. I'd like us to end by just thinking about that for a minute and processing it. Can we process the things that are going on in our life and how much we are letting the Holy Spirit in? How much we're allowing the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus in us, in the decisions we're making, in the habits we've formed, in the lifestyles we live? How much of it is designed around what the Holy Spirit is doing? How much of it is designed around what I want to do? Let's think about that for a moment, process it, And then I'd like us to respond. So could we just bow our heads and think about that for a minute? And then we'll we'll close.